for joining us on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. We have a simple goal here on Concord Matters, to seek unity in our confession of the Christian faith through the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 15, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We seek this harmony that Paul speaks about by the Holy Spirit through the study of the clear and concise teachings confessed in the Book of Concord. Because you see, the Book of Concord is not another Bible, but we believe, teach, and confess that these writings are in accord with nothing other than the Scriptures themselves. We believe, teach, and confess that they are what they say they are, and the Holy Scriptures are our source and hope. So what do we do? We believe, teach, and confess it boldly. I'm your host, Brady Finnern, District President of the Minnesota North District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Today, we go back to the source of our Christian life, baptism, holy baptism. I remember going to seminary, and our professors were constantly talking about their baptism, celebrating baptismal birthdays. The new hymnal was coming out, so I was hearing all the great baptismal life hymns, and I remember thinking, why do we talk about baptism so much? Well, I think the doctor, Dr. Norman Nagel said it once in a class. One of my buddies had a class with him at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, and he said very boldly, I can't do his accent, one can never talk about baptism too much. And we believe it because that's how the scriptures speak. So here we go. Open up your book of Concord, open up your Bible, and let's start confessing. If you have any questions concerning our study of the Augsburg Confession and about baptism, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. Joining us in the Confession of Christ, we welcome Pastor Paul Kane, pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Sheridan, Wyoming. Pastor Kane, welcome to Concord Matters. Thank you very much. Howdy from Wyoming. Yeah, very good. I think I said Shane there. I apologize. Pastor Kane. <laughs> I was getting all excited with my S's. So anyways, Pastor Kane, it's great to have you uh, back with us on KFUO. This is our first time together here on Concord Matters. So tell us about yourself and, and the work of the Saints at Emmanuel and also your school. I'm a 2000 graduate of Concordia Seminary St. Louis. I was blessed to have Dr. Nagel for four courses, including Holy Baptism. Yeah. Um, out of respect, I refrained from doing the acts, <laughs> exactly. but try to retain the good confession of the faith. Mm. In fact, it's only been in the last few months I've figured out some of his teaching uh, techniques. Wow. Uh, our school here in Sheridan has been around for 20 years. We're modest in size, but very vigorous. We'll have about 30 students with uh, three teachers, including our headmaster, the Reverend Rene Castellero. Uh, Emmanuel Lutheran has been at its current location since 58, but we've been in the community since 1903. Hmm. And 10 years before that, we had a cowboy preacher who organized the German-speaking Lutherans, and surprisingly, some English-speaking Lutherans that had already acculturated. We're just down the street from the Rodeo Arena and the Sheridan Inn that used to be owned by Buffalo Bill Cody. <laughs> you, you gave me more than more than, than we bargained for this morning. <laughs> Who would have known? We're Andrew West here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, and and thank you for. Uh, your work in Wyoming uh, for us here in Minnesota and for us in the rest of the country, it's it just a reminder for you, our listeners, that we each each congregation is placed with a different history, a different context, but the same confession. And that is what we do uh, to bring salvation, uh, God's word, care for souls where we are. And we thank God for those differences, but obviously the un unity in Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Pastor, we are here talking about or confessing baptism from the Augsburg Confession. Reminder to our listeners, we are studying in the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, uh, Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions from Concordia Publishing House, which is on page 35 in the article, article 9 on baptism. Now, Pastor, as I mentioned, we have talked about baptism a lot, and so we're just kind of rehashing it uh, over and over again. Do we really need to keep talking about it? 
We really do. We as Christians sometimes forget the promises. We need the comfort of Christ and to be reminded of the gospel gift. Dr. Nagel always encouraged us to have joy in our baptisms. We have wonderful hymnody, including God's own child, I'm gl I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. The hymn does not say I was baptized, mm. but I am, because our baptisms still count, still effective. And when we bless uh, young children, we ask that the Lord preserve them in their baptismal grace. We also need to keep talking about holy baptism because other Christians do not have the same confession as we do and the scriptures do with regard to holy baptism. Scripture is clear that God does the work, but others say that they're making a decision or they're choosing or they're going into it as if they are doing the action. So by reviewing the word by confessing along with the Lutherans and the Augsburg Confession, we can be comforted and prepared for eternal life as well as today and tomorrow. I love how you referenced the hymn, uh, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It. One, it's a, I can't say my favorite hymn. That's like saying I have a favorite child or something, but it it is definitely one of those that we constantly go back to, because not only should we sing it when a child is baptized or a person is baptized, it's a practice in our own home that we sing that hymn when we have a baptismal birthday. And then also, uh, I remember Pastor Will Whedon speaking very clearly that this should be at every single funeral as well. And the words are so clear, as you said, uh, stanza one, God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. He, because I could not pay it, gave my full redemption price. Do I need earth treasures many? I have one worth more than any. That brought me salvation free, lasting to eternity. Meaning not only showing us I baptize now, but this has lasting eternal significance for each one who's baptized into Christ. Any any other thoughts on this great hymn? We may as well go there because we're I'm all excited about it. Well, I remember... Uh, singing that in the hymnal supplement and just treasuring it right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. The original um, text in German would normally be what the hymn tune would be called, but because that name was already taken in the index, they went with the composer, Bachhofen, not to be confused with Bach. Our vacation Bible schools love to sing that hymn and... It's great for grown-ups too. <laughs> exactly. Well, baptismal life is a wonderful section of hymns in Lutheran service book. I tell you what, let's do a little bit of a plug here. If you go, if you were to go into your hymnal, and I encourage you to to purchase a hymnal, a Lutheran service book, is that you would go to hymn number five ninety four, which is page five ninety four in, in it, and you go all the way. I'm sorry, I'm looking through it right now to six hundred and. Da -da 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 -da. 604, I believe it is. Uh, oh, 605, excuse me. And there's a lot of rich proclamation in these hymns that not only are fun to sing, as you said, uh, uh, BBS kids, but also it, it, pre it proclaims. It proclaims beautifully what we believe, teach, and confess as we do in the, in the confessions. So there we go. We might get through the whole hymn today. We'll see what happens as we go through holy <laughs> baptism today. Pastor, um, any other thoughts you have about why we, once again, are rehashing baptism? Baptism is also the focus of confirmation. Confirmation isn't supposed to be a graduation. I understand that for some families, it, it may be thought of that way, which is sad. But confirmation is actually confirmation of baptism, where the young adult or older adult gets to confess with his or her own lips and mind and heart the faith into which they were baptized as a younger person, maybe even an infant. Well, let's start digging in. Like I mentioned, we are in the reader's edition of the Lutheran Confessions on page 35 uh, from Concordia Publishing House. And I will begin with the note. And I do encourage you, our listeners, not only to have your confessions open, but also your Bible. Because often we might get 
uh, heady. We might get philosophical even sometimes in how we proclaim baptism. But everything we do as Lutherans, everything that confessions are about is the scriptures. So if we have our confessions open and never open our Bibles, then we're missing it. And uh, But at the same time, we don't really want to open our Bibles while we open our confessions. And so it goes back and forth, but the full authority is in Scripture. So page 35 of Article 9, Baptism, we'll begin with the note. The Bible teaches that baptism is a gift of God's grace by which he applies the benefits of Christ's life, death, and resurrection to us personally. Because all people are conceived and born in sin, we all need salvation. Because baptism is God's way of bringing us salvation, infants should also be baptized. During the Reformation, as now, some Christian groups turned baptism from God's saving activity into the act of Christian obedience. The view of baptism arises from the denial of original sin and a semi-Pelagian view of salvation, whereby faith becomes the good work we contribute. This article concentrates on what God gives in the sacrament, which we also look at the Apology, Small Call, and the Large Catechism in the Lutheran Confessions. Pastor, I think that's a great uh, beginning as we look at uh, baptism. It speaks about children. It talks about the benefits of, of what Christ gave and also some of the controversies of those days. Anything you want to highlight before we dig in? I'd like to highlight especially that baptism is a gift. It's not a work. As we'll see in Titus chapter 3, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, God is the one doing the work. He gives his gifts, which are neither earned or deserved. Um, you've got grace right in there as another gospel word. Mm. And this is the delivery of Calvary. All of Christ's life, death, and resurrection is delivered to us here and now. If we want the forgiveness of sins, and we do, we don't have to book a plane trip over to Jerusalem and try to find a remnant of the true cross. We don't have to invent a time machine and go back to Good Friday in order to get the forgiveness of sins. God himself has seen to it to deliver to us in word and his sacraments all from Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Hey, we lose sight of that. Um, often we think about baptism as kind of a, a singular magical event. I would say in culture, I'll say it that way, that you'll have movies that kind of have the holy water. I, I remember a movie called The Lost Boys back in the day where they were fighting vampires and they go into the, the Catholic church, I believe it was, and they went and got their squirt guns and brought the water out and started spraying the vampires and these kind of things. And so there's kind of a... a we'll separate baptism from the cross. And I love how the note really brings it back, that the benefits that happen in Christ's life, death, and resurrection come to us personally through baptism, which just, we, we don't, like you said, we don't need to go back to Jerusalem to, to find hope. Where we find hope is on the cross. And what a gift it is that he gives it to us now. The benefits that happen then, he gives it to us now, which is, um, like you said, as the, as the hymn tells us, God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. Pastor, anything else you want to highlight? You don't need water from the Jordan River either. <laughs> water here in Wyoming and where our listeners are is included in the institution of Christ. Well, thanks be to you. It's water. Thanks be, thanks be to God. And this, I remind you to our listeners too, I'll go back. We did study the um, the ba baptism in the small catechism to start off my time here, at least on Concord Matters, and had some great studies on holy baptism that I would encourage you to listen to as we dig in as well. Pastor, I do want to ask a few questions here at the end of this. Uh, you know what? Oh, I'm going to wait. We're going to confess. Uh, you, want, you ready to get into it? Yes, okay. let's do it. All right. So Article 9, Baptism from the Augsburg Confession. Concerning baptism. Our churches teach that baptism is necessary for salvation and that God's grace is offered through baptism, Titus 3, and also from Mark 16. They teach that children are to be baptized, Acts 2, 38-39. Being, being offered to God through baptism, they are received into God's grace. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who reject the baptism of children and say that children are saved without 
baptism. Now, Pastor, these words a little bit, you know, I, we probably wouldn't talk exactly in this way, but it says that baptism is necessary for salvation. And that might make people a little uncomfortable. Tell us about what Scripture says, baptism and salvation. Well, let's go to Mark 16, verse 16. This is Jesus um, giving Mark's version of the Great Commission after his resurrection, uh, before his ascension a few verses later. Mark 16, 16 confesses this, uh, these words of our Lord, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Jesus himself speaks in the language of, here's the positive, but also here is something that does need to be condemned. And we could lay out four different situations just on the basis of this verse. If somebody believes and is baptized, what is the promise? Will be saved. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And Jesus addresses two other situations in the latter half. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. As you mentioned in pop culture, movies, etc., baptism is sort of seen as magic or pseudo-magic. We even have the witch and the Wizard of Oz melting because of water. Hmm. Um, sorry for the spoiler there to those who haven't seen the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Whoever does not believe will be condemned covers those who have not been baptized and do not believe, but also, sadly, those who have been baptized but no longer believe. It is possible to lose one's salvation. Baptism is not magical, and this is one corrective that the Lutherans would have for um Roman Catholic teaching about baptism. But then we end up with the fourth situation, right? Jesus doesn't specifically address it here, but I call this um, the awkward teenager question. Mm. But Pastor Kane, what if somebody believes and they're on their way to church to be baptized, but there's a horrible car accident? And that's why I call it the awkward teenager question, because it sounds really bad, that kind of situation. It's not the lack of baptism that would condemn, but Jesus says it's the lack of faith, one who does not believe, that condemns. We could certainly go to Luke and talk to the thief on the cross. This is before Jesus' institution of baptism. But Jesus, given his hands were nailed to a cross, and so was the believing, repentant thief, um, Jesus could not administer baptism at that time, which is why we focus on the promises. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It's not the lack of baptism that condemns, but the lack of faith, but Anyone who has the opportunity to be baptized should be. And Augustana, Article 9 is correct. Baptism is necessary for salvation. It's necessary because Jesus institutes it. It's necessary because Jesus commands it. So somebody is arguing with you and says, well, I don't need to be baptized. And you're like, okay. Um, Tell me more. <laughs> and then they say, well, what, what's the benefit of baptism? And go through the whole list like we, like we are today. And I know one pastor said, well, if you get into that kind of argument and someone says, well, I don't need to be baptized. But then you say, well, but you should. Here's what you receive from it. And, and that's kind of the, the questions are always, you know, all these hypothetical kind of heady, we're caught in the clouds type of questions. Like, for example, what if you're in the middle of a desert? and there's no water, and this person confesses Christ, and they're about to die, but there's no water, what do you do? You know, kind of one of those kind of awkward teenage questions as well. And Dr. John Kleinig just said it beautifully, is, okay, you want, you want the gifts of Christ, what should you do? Be baptized. Here's what you get. 
as opposed to always asking all these questions, be baptized and find comfort in your baptism. Pastor, what else do you want to highlight as we, as, you know, baptism, salvation. We also look at Titus chapter 3 if you want to go there. Certainly. I'd love to go there. While everybody's turning there, I wanted to mention a Dr. Nagel saying. <laughs> he said, faith does not reject the gifts of God. Faith doesn't say no to God. Faith always says yes. Mm -hmm. I like to picture uh, a Christmas tree with gifts, and people love Christmas. People love gifts and exchanging gifts and being generous to others. But if you're at grandma's house and you know there are, there are boxes under that tree with your name on them, you're not going to tell grandma, thank you for the socks and the underwear, but I'm going to say no to the gift that's still sitting under the tree with my name on it. Mm -hmm. So too, a Christian who is a Christian with faith, with trust in Christ, is going to say yes, please, and thank you for all of the gifts of the gospel, including baptism. Titus chapter 3, 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Those first three words in most English translations of verse 5 answer so much of what many American evangelicals question about baptism. But they don't always go to Titus chapter 3, and they really should. God, our Savior, saved us. How? Well, not because of works done by us in righteousness, which would cover rejecting baptism as a work that we do ourselves, but according to his own mercy, not giving us what we deserve, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Washing is the baptism word right there whom he poured out on us richly, there's another baptism word there referring to the Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I love being an heir. I get to receive the gifts of Jesus. When he establishes, when he institutes Holy Communion, his last will and testament in his body and blood, he would be the one who gets to be the executor of his own last will and testament. He remains doing the doing. Uh, we could also say who's running the verbs. Mm. God is. Mm -hmm. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is baptism. And this is, once again, I, I really encourage our listeners to go back to the small catechism, which is, you know, just as clear, but it speaks specifically of Titus chapter 3. How can water do such great things? Which is another maybe awkward high school question of, well, how can water do such things? Which is where Luther points us straight to Titus chapter 3, because the emphasis is always on who's driving the verb, which is another, I believe that's another Nagelism if we're going to go there again today. Um, <laughs> it is. I love it. Pastor, with about a minute left before our break, other highlights you want to have as we've gone through two passages in Mark and also in Titus. Luther's explanation on how water can do such great things is rather practical. He does analyze the practice and what the practice confesses. With the Word of God, it is a baptism. But without the Word of God, the water is simple water and no baptism. It's a bath. It's a new parent taking home their son or daughter and giving them a bath in the kitchen sink. But with the Word of God, it is something else. A washing of life, a gracious water of life, and a washing of regeneration in the Holy Spirit. This is a trustworthy saying. Uh, we didn't mention that in the earlier quote, but this is something that you can base your life on. 
God's word is trustworthy and endures even unto eternal life. Well, we need to take our break right now. We're going to continue our confession of holy baptism according to scripture. Studying the ninth article of the Augsburg Confession will be right back. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Put this wisdom of God into practice by listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple, and faithful pastors from around the world help sharpen my faith in Christ every episode. I know you'll be blessed by listening and studying God's Word with us. Listen to Sharper Iron weekdays at 8 a.m. on KFUO and on demand at KFUO.org, the KFUO radio app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Welcome back. We are studying uh, Holy Baptism, excuse me, according to the ninth article of the Augsburg Confession with Pastor Paul Kane of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Sheridan, Wyoming. Now, Pastor, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recite another stanza from God's Own Child 594, which is num- uh, verse number two, stanza number two. Sin disturbed my soul no longer. I am baptized into Christ. I have comfort even stronger. Jesus cleansing sacrifice. Should a guilty conscience seize me, since my baptism did release me, in a dear forgiving flood, sprinkling me with Jesus' blood. I think here it really captures, especially as we look at this cleansing, the salvation that comes from God in Titus and chapter Mark, when it, or Mark chapter 16, is, you know, sin disturbed my soul no longer, I am baptized into Christ, meaning my, our conscience can be clear. Because we are baptized, even though it happened for many of us without remembering it, which is kind of counter how we live in our culture. And why is that so important that even though we don't remember it, it still happened and our conscience can be clear? A lot of things happened in history before any of us were personally alive. It is wonderful to avoid chronological snobbery, to recognize that There were intelligent, Bible-reading, scholarly, pious Christians who knew the Word long before it was ever preached to our ancestors. And we dare not um, disrespect their witness, as saints will get to see in heaven, too. Jesus' blood sprinkled on us certainly recalls the temple practices but also the sprinkling application of water as one way to do baptism. Um, I found another passage in Mark that might be of interest to our hearers today. It doesn't sound like it's about baptism, but I want to review it rather quickly. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to Jesus, Mark 7, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands, that were defiled, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. It's a very obscure text, but it does address baptism because it's the same Greek word even though the English word wash is used in this and many other translations. It also shows that uh, if you're talking about administering baptism, it just means wash. In order for baptism to mean immerse, as some Christian traditions uh, really, really insist on, Mm. then it has to, that Greek word in the New Testament means to mean immerse everywhere, and it simply does not. You're, you may immerse a cup or a pot, but maybe not grandma's Thanksgiving turkey enamel pan. You can still wash it, though. And dining couches, you're definitely got, not going to immerse, but you are going to wash. <laughs> and this is great because what is the power in is how you're doing it, how much or is, like you said, in small catechism, is it the water and the word? 
And that is a great uh, text for you, our listeners, to to look at as well and to speak about you know, what is happening in holy baptism and what is what is required. So, so Pastor, as we look at this, the 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 move that that Melanchthon and the Concordians made is they speak about the grace of God, salvation that is there. As we look at uh, look at the small catechism that we speak about, forgiveness of sins rescues from death and the devil and gives eternal salvation who all will believe this as the words and promises of God declare. And here it speaks about children, which I find fascinating because a lot of the controversies that we are hearing today from people, especially our young people, revolves around, do I baptize babies or do I not? And it was in those days as well. So pastor, why would we as crazy Lutherans baptize babies? Jesus welcomes children. Uh, Mark 10 says it this way, they brought young children to Jesus that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them, rebuked those who brought children to Jesus. But when Jesus saw it, saw all of this, he was greatly displeased with his own disciples and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. We could also go to the text uh, mentioned in brackets in the reader's edition by the editors, Acts 2, 38 through 39. This, chapter 2, is the first Christian Pentecost. And Peter has just finished preaching a sermon where he calls them to repentance. Verse 36 says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you, plural, crucified. Mm. Insert y'all if, if you're from the South. <laughs> now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. The Spirit is calling them to repentance. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? What shall we do? Now, there's an American answer for this. It's called an altar call. But that's not what Peter says. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, basically all y'all, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. When Peter says that, it's really hard for anybody to deny that if you believe that Scripture is the Word of God. And we do, because it is. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So far from giving nothing, as some Christians confess about baptism, even if they insist on believers only and immersion baptism, they still say it does nothing. Scripture, on the other hand, says, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've also heard, repent and be baptized every one of you. For the promise, and here we go, talking about gospel promises again, good news promises, gift, is for you, plural, and for your children, still a Greek word that includes nursing infants, and for all who are far off, there's where we get included again here in the ends of the earth, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Well, it's quite a sermon. He invites them to be baptized, 3,000 baptized in verse 41. Amazing. When we break it down just with the plain text, it becomes very clear about all the gifts that baptism has. And I, and I do encourage everybody here to go back uh, when we speak, especially when we speak about the baptism of infants, because we had on the program here in Concord Matters, uh, Pastor Dennis McFadden, who was a Baptist for 62 years of his life, <laughs> and he became a Lutheran, and he just he just he just can't help but sing like the hymn "God's Own Child." I gladly say it because he lived so long in his life where he's like, "Well, you can't baptize a baby. There's no there's nothing happening." And when he looked at the scriptures again and saw the benefits, 
that it just is so much grace and joy that he was able to express. Uh, this would have happened in February that we had this um, um, show on Concord Matters here. But Pastor, when you speak about, okay, uh, repent and, and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, what else does Scripture tell us about the benefits? Uh, what happens when one is baptized into Christ? Luther is a great person to go to on this. When he talks about Mark 16, 16, as the words and promises of God that we've covered already, his immediate answer says it works forgiveness of sins. We can show that right here in Acts chapter 2. Delivers from death and the devil and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. If you're going to talk about baptism, it's only fair that you bring in all of the passages about baptism. Luther brings in Matthew 28, which we can still cover, Mark 16, Titus chapter 3, but also Romans, mm. Romans chapter 6. And I love how he includes this. He mentions this as one of the benefits before he gives you the Bible for it, but here it is. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And if you take a look at our baptism liturgy, we've got those promises uh, as a white funeral pall lays over the casket or the urn, as a white robe of righteousness that covers all of that baptized saint's sin. And that is such a powerful part of the funeral. Now, if you do purchase a hymnal, it is important for you to go to the funeral rite that is on that in our hymnal, the Lutheran service book because it does give that opportunity for a visual for people to see. That is, it speaks about baptism, you know, dying in Christ and rising to new life, Romans chapter 6. You get the same language in Colossians. And that language shows us that although there is death, there is a hope in Christ, which we're robed in Christ's righteousness. And, and so a lot of times we put a pall on, like you mentioned, there's other uh, realities, for example, when a child is baptized, that that a lot of times they're wearing white. I've seen it, uh, one of my classmates at seminary, Jonathan Fisk, a lot of times when, mm -hmm. when his children would be baptized, they would be wearing black. So he'd you know wrap them in black, meaning death, and so they get baptized, and then and then the his wife would <laughs> take the child and then quickly change it. Of course, it's probably mass chaos, as we know, when our children are little, and then they would put them in white, just that visual reminder of what is actually happening, which is amazing to think about because it's such a simple act, but yet this is what is all happening. Pastor Elsa, what else do you want to highlight? I remember at my first congregation, I had the joy of catechizing a young man between his graduation from high school and going off to boot camp. Mm. He was going into the military. Uh, the relationship the girlfriend who brought him to church didn't last, but his commitment to Christ did. Mm. And he asked about what are the what are the traditions? How should I show up? And I said, well, often people wear white. And uh, he showed up on his baptism day in a white tuxedo he rented for the occasion. Oh, that is phenomenal. He looked so classy. <laughs> the pictures are awesome. And the congregation just welcomed him like a brand new son. Wow. What a, what a, oh, that's a great story. That is a great story. Thanks be to God as we confess, and not only confess it with our lips, but also show it visually for everyone to see. So, Pastor, as we, as we look at the baptism for all nations, as Jesus tells us, we hear of all the gifts that baptism gives. Uh, I'm reminded once again, God's own child, I gladly say it. It points us to Satan, hear this proclamation, I am baptized into Christ. Drop your ugly accusation, I am not so soon enticed. 
Now that to the font I've traveled, all your might has come unraveled, and against your tyranny, God my Lord unites with me. It speaks here, I mean, we don't really get this in the, the confession here, but there is that reality that when a person is baptized, our identity as a baptized child of God um, is, a, in essence, a fight against Satan himself. Your thoughts? It is. I make a point to catechize parents or guardians, uh, whoever's willing to meet with me before we do a baptism, ideally days before, so they know what to expect from the scriptures. They know what we believe, teach, and confess, especially in the small catechism. It's a good time to review that, as well as go through the rite of holy baptism uh, so they know when the sponsors would say their parts, and we confess the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer, pray the Lord's Prayer uh, as part of the baptism. I encourage them to continue bringing their children to church. They will take their child home and feed and change and clothe and shelter and love and educate, but the child does need to be brought up in the faith our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It is a given to authority to Jesus. And he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How? One, baptizing them, and secondly, teaching them. There's more here, but those are the two things that Christians are to do to make disciples of all nations. Some churches use discipling in a very, very different way, but word and baptism are the two essential things. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, three names in one name, both in Greek and in English, so the theology checks out, even before Christians invented a shorthand word, tri-unity, trinity, mm. to confess three and one and one and three, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, all that I have given you to cherish, would be the Nagel Standard Version here, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. With baptism, we have enough to study to the end of the age because it is the gift of God, which is a mystery. My God, my God, why have you not forsaken me, right. but instead have given me the righteousness of Christ? And pastor, as we, as we look at all these benefits, it is, it is always, a, we, like I said, we can get lost in the clouds of trying to figure out some sociological understanding of how is this possible how can the how can water do such great things as it talks about in uh, the small catechism and and we can get lost in all these understandings which is why i love today that we're going through all just what scripture says i have a, a, a dear friend who's a pastor and there was a, a a young man who was going through his seminary training and he's just wasn't sure if he believed in baptism we're very very influenced by American evangelicalism. That is very much so like, well, no, you have to make a choice. And so this young man was talking to my my friend and and it got to the point where they were just kind of going back and forth and circling the wagons, if you will, never really getting to everything that was really needed to be done. And my friend says, let's just go to the Bible. <laughs> and so I just yeah. encourage you, our listeners, that when, Jesus, when it says, when Peter says, baptism now saves you, uh, we have to believe it. I mean, what else can you, how else can you interpret this? I mean, it's just what it is. And so let scripture speak, the Holy Spirit lead people. And for us to be comforted in it, like it says, this is not a past event. This is a identity as a baptized child of God. Pastor, I do want to get to the uh, Anabaptists and my Pelagianism, all that good stuff. But I want to make sure we're very clear of what we're confessing about holy baptism. Anything else you want to highlight? Yes. Um, 1 Peter mm. 3.21. When I was a seminarian in St. Louis, uh, I had the opportunity to interact with another seminarian in St. Louis, but not my friends, not my classmates, not those um, 
in study with years behind me or years in front of me, but a, a seminarian from another seminary in the city. Hmm. And we had the opportunity to have a very awkward supper. And he said, okay, 1 Peter 3.21, it says, baptism now saves you. Do you believe that? <laughs> and I said, you don't? It's a Bible verse. Since when did the professors at your seminary say we could delete verses of the Bible because they were difficult or because we didn't want to believe them? I'll never forget that interaction. <laughs> baptism not. now saves you is true because Jesus says baptism saves you. Jesus gave it as a means to deliver his salvation. Well, Scripture says it, therefore we believe it. That's something we hold to hold true as Lutherans, and it's very valuable for us to always remember, because too often we can get lost in the questions, as in, and we need to go back to God's Word. So, Pastor, right at the Indeed. end of Article 9, it speaks about the current, the controversies in those days, which, ironic enough, are still controversies to this day. So it says, our churches condemn the Anabaptists, who reject the baptism of children, and say that children are saved without baptism. Pastor, what can you tell us about Anabaptists? Or in our note, in the beginning, introductory, it talks about semi-Pelagian understanding of everything. Tell us about that. Yes. So Anabaptism, uh, Anabaptists are part of a Reformation movement called the Radical Reformation. It's considered Protestant. They required that candidates for baptism be able to make a confession of faith and they reject the baptism of infants. There's a difference between being able to talk and having faith, which is one thing that they um, missed out on. Anabaptists dare not be confused with modern Baptists. Anabaptists today will very commonly be found as Mennonites or Amish, though their beliefs and uh, local governance can vary quite widely. In the uh, note, it mentioned this other view, semi-Pelagianism. Pelagius essentially confessed that you can take care of yourself, you can save yourself. Some have modified this to either beginning the relationship with God, and then God saves you and does the rest, or God initiates it, but you have to do a little something, and then God finishes the rest. Or God begins it, and then you have to finish it by an act, um, some sort of religious act. Scripture re rebukes this sort of thing. It sounds harsh to condemn something, but false teaching does need to be condemned for the sake of those who would be led astray by it. I always like to lead with the positive. Here's what we believe. But in order to fully confess the faith, we sometimes have to reject the teachings of false teachers. And the idea of decision theology, as widespread and as popular it is, as it is, and as beloved as some of its teachers are and have been, it does need to be rejected because of Scripture. Those who say you need to choose, you need to make a decision, will commonly point people to Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 15. Mm. And they will quote with dots in the middle, meaning that some parts are left out. So it ends up being eviscerated like this. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I get nervous when verses are left out, when context is left out. Joshua is saying farewell. The next subject heading you'll find in your Bible is something like Joshua's death and Joshua's burial. He's saying goodbye, and he wants to warn them. So I'm going to rewind one verse and read all of 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. This is First Commandment 101. Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. 
But verse 15 doesn't begin with, choose this day whom you will serve. Nope. What's left out? And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. In order to choose, according to Joshua, you have to say it's evil to serve the Lord. Now, plenty in our culture, especially um, last month, the month of June, have said it's evil to serve the Lord. Mm. But the choice is between whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose these pagan gods who are idols or these pagan gods who are idols. And then, verse 15 finishes, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There is nothing like the kind of choice that American decision theology demands in the scriptures. Mm. Actually, quite the opposite. Jesus, in John 15, verse 16, says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Jesus actually asks you into his heart, not the opposite. It is quite fascinating to think about the gift that the Lord has given us. And this gift is that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord. And I, I do encourage you, our listeners, to look at Joshua 24 again, because guaranteed... You talk Lutheranly at all, someone's going to pull out Joshua 24. And very important to look at the, 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 the whole verses and to understand the context of what Joshua is saying. That we are able to believe that faith is a gift, and that gift is given to us in baptism. And it is something that we do not deserve on our own whatsoever, what we do. And here, here's the powerful part of when we baptize that baby. That baby can't do anything. <laughs> that baby cool. costs us money. That baby can't change themselves. They cry at night. They are totally dependent on others. And what a great visual the Lord has given to us that this child is totally dependent on other people. And we in our whole life are totally dependent on the Lord for forgiveness, life, and salvation. What a gift the Lord gives us that we're able to give to all nations. Pastor, we have three minutes left in our time. Um, I just, I, I do want to go through one more stanza on 594, but I want to get your last thoughts on, uh, on, on, on baptism and the importance of baptism for our listeners. Baptism is a teaching of comfort. If you read it according to Holy Scripture, I have talked with many people that they wonder if they really, really meant it when they were baptized in this other tradition where the emphasis was on their work. And they've even submitted to being baptized again and again and again because they were relying on their emotions and their own works rather than the promise of Christ. This is one place where in evangelicalism, the idea of works righteousness actually comes back in a very, very sad way. Your listeners will know from Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, that there's a document in there much longer than the Augsburg Confession called the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. It doesn't mean we're so sorry for the Augsburg Confession. It is a defense of the Augsburg Confession. And I love how Article 9 there begins that the Roman Catholics who were there to hear the original presentation of the Augsburg Confession, approved of Article 9. This is not as high authority as Scripture itself, but it's not nothing. If you're talking with somebody from a different tradition, a different denomination, and they say, you Lutherans are the weird ones, no. Historically speaking, Christians have baptized their children except for maybe 40 years in the 300s, and since Anabaptists and then Baptists um, have separated themselves and denied the promises of Christ. 
baptism is a wonderful, comforting gift. As the stanza says, 594, God's own child, I gladly say it, stanza five. There is nothing worth comparing to this lifelong comfort sure. Open eyed, my open eyed, my grave is staring. Even there, I'll sleep secure. Though my flesh awaits its raising, still my soul continues praising. I am baptized into Christ. I am a child of paradise. Pastor Paul Kane of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Sheridan, Wyoming, clearly confessing the truth of holy baptism. Pastor Kane, thank you for your faithful teaching on holy baptism. Thank you very much. Great to be here. I'm your host, Pastor Brady Finner. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe.